Hello everyone, it's... Uh, me. If you've been following along with my previous landscape materials videos, or if you've just been messing around with the default uh, Quixel Megascans material, which looks like this, you might be thinking, okay, uh, I know how to use the albedo as the base color texture of my material. I know how to use the roughness to create a little bit of roughness in the material. I know what a normal map is and how to use it to fake bumpiness. But there is a another type of texture that comes as a default export of the Quixel Bridge plugin called Displacement. And so far, we haven't looked at how to use that. So this video will go into what Displacement is and how to use it. At its core, displacement is a, another way to create bumpiness in your material. But unlike normals, which fake bumpiness by changing the way that light interacts with a flat surface, displacement physically moves, or virtually moves, the actual geometry. And that movement is determined by the brightness values of the displacement map. So areas which are bright will get raised up, and areas which are dark will get lowered down relative to the rest of the material. The big problem with this type of displacement is that it relies on moving the actual vertices of the object, so the points at which the geometry comes together. If we go into our viewport and uh, click on the lit drop-down menu, which opens the view mode menu, and turn on brush wireframe, we will now see the wireframe of our world, so the, the underlying geometry of the world. If we look at the mannequin, for example, there's a lot of geometry here. But if we look at the landscape, the landscape is relatively low poly. The landscape is made up of relatively big triangles, which over a large scale create a very smooth landscape, but on a small scale, don't really give us the detail needed to distinguish this rock, for instance, from the space around it. What we need to do then is find some way to be able to split up the triangles which are close to us but leave the triangles in the distance relatively low poly to save on performance. Fortunately, to do that in Unreal is very, very simple. So let's get started on how we can go about this. First of all, I'm going to open up the material that I'm using for this landscape. I am using a damp mud texture pack from Quixel Megascans. And the reason I'm doing that right now is just because this texture has a large rock in it. And I think that will be a good demonstration of something that is taller than the rest of the material in the scene. So the rock is going to stick out uh, and the, the displacement texture is going to really help accentuate that. So the material that I've got on my world at the moment, on my landscape at the moment, is looks like this. For now, I'm going to focus only on displacement, so I'm not going to concern myself with things like uh, the landscape layer blends where you can paint on different textures or uh, detailing where we can break up this uh, repeated grid pattern. I'll save those concerns for other videos, which I will link to below. I have also brought in the displacement texture as a separate texture sample. And let's figure out what we are going to do with it. Before we use the displacement, we need to turn on tessellation. And tessellation is the process of breaking up those bigger triangles into smaller triangles as we get closer. So to turn on tessellation, I'm going to click an empty space in my material graph, and then in the details panel type tess, and get an option to turn on tessellation. We can choose flat tessellation or PN triangles. I'm going to choose flat tessellation for now. If you have a more recent version of Unreal Engine, you will also have the option to toggle adaptive tessellation. For now, I'm going to leave that on and talk a little bit more about how we can create our own adaptive tessellation later on. The adaptive tessellation option will essentially create a high tessellation close to the camera where you want a lot of detail and then fade out to no tessellation far away from the camera where you don't need that sort of detail. Let's have a look at what all of this looks like. All right, shaders have compiled. So far, we haven't changed any output of the material, so I don't expect there to be any visual difference from what we had before. But if we go into the brush wireframe, now things look a lot different. As you can see, close to the camera, we have a lot more triangles than we did previously. And then if I increase my camera speed a little, as we zoom out further in the distance, our triangles condense back to their original size, uh, meaning that we are not 
processing extra detail, extra unnecessary detail, further away from the camera. The fantastic thing about tessellation is that the blend between no tessellation and tessellation is very smooth. If you look carefully at what's happening within each triangle, each triangle is splitting up into a number of sub-triangles in a very smooth manner, meaning that each level of detail is smoothly transitioned between, between low detail and high detail. So that's what tessellation is, and it's really just a single button to click. At this point, I would like to mention that this type of tessellation can be very heavy on your machine. So this is a technique that you should be using only if you're targeting higher end platforms or consoles, and definitely not if you're doing something mobile or even something for lower end PCs. Okay, now that we have tessellation working, let's get started on adding some of that displacement. So we have a displacement texture, which is telling us which areas to raise and which areas to lower. But how do we actually go about raising and lowering those areas? The first thing that I want to do is take the texture output, which is going to be a value between 0 and 1, and scale that so it is actually a value between negative 1 and 1. And the negative values will lower the terrain, and the positive values will high, raise, raise the terrain. This process of scaling a range from 0 to 1 to negative 1 to 1 is uh, a relatively simple, is a pretty simple one. We multiply by 2. and then subtract 1. Multiply by 2, subtract 1. Excellent. And now that I've got that, I want to scale this negative 1 to 1 um, to a new range of my own choosing, which will ultimately influence the height of the final uh, displacement. So for that, I'm going to create a parameter called displacement height and multiply the output of our texture into by by this displacement height just for kicks i'm going to create a slider here between 0 and 10 with a default displacement of 1 at the moment uh, this collection of nodes outputs a number a height but we also need to tell our displacement a direction so which direction are you going to be moving the physical vertex towards. Generally for this type of thing, we're only raising and lowering, which means that we want to be moving the vertex along its normal, so its idea of what up is. For that, there is a vertex normal world space node, which will give us the normal of that vertex. And if we multiply that vertex normal by the output of our texture sample, once we multiply the normal of that vertex, by the amount that we want to raise or lower the terrain, we'll be raising and lowering that uh, vertex along its own relative idea of up. Now that we have that, we can take the output of this into our world displacement. And one thing that I didn't really touch upon when we, when we enabled tessellation, two new output slots opened up for us, the world displacement and the tessellation multiplier. World displacement is similar to world position offset, it moves a vertex by a specific amount, which is what the whole point of this displacement is, but it does that after the tessellation process. So we then have access to all those tiny detailed vertices that have been tessellated by the, by the material. Uh, and then tessellation multiplier, this controls the amount of tessellation. With the adaptive tessellation enabled, we don't really have to worry about this too much, but I will talk about it more in a second. For now, let's see what happens when we apply the changes that we've just made and hop back over into the editor. Okay, compiled things have compiled and let's open up the material instance and see that our displacement height is currently at one. At the moment, nothing looks like it's changed, but if we move real close into the material, you'll see that very faintly, there is, there is now a little bit of bumpiness to the surface. And what we might need to do to accentuate that bumpiness a little is change our displacement height to something like 5. And then once we get low to the surface, we can see that our rock has now raised itself and the areas around have added a little bit of extra bumpiness. If we go back into our brush wireframe, 
we can see that the displacement is physically moving those vertices around and creating actual bumpiness on our landscape, unlike a normal, which just fakes it. The delightful thing here is that the adaptive tessellation figures out the gnarly business of when to display what level of detail. So when I'm up close, I have enough detail to see all the bumps, but when I'm far away, the the adaptive tessellation makes sure that um, I'm not processing extra vertices when I don't need to. Okay, back in our lit material. You can play around with the displacement height, and that's pretty much all we really need to do. Great, that's the basics of displacement. Turn on tessellation, make sure adaptive tessellation is enabled, and then add an offset to your vertex position based on the vertex normal. If that's all you came for, then great, you can stop here and uh, continue on with your life. However, there is one potential problem with the way that things are currently set up. If your displacement height is relatively low, for example, three or two units, you might not see this as an issue and it might be completely irrelevant. However, if your tessellation is relatively high, so in my case around nine, I start to notice at the sort of breaks of the level of detail, there's a little bit of weird popping, bubbling, uh, don't know how to describe it, uh, where the vertices no longer match up, you suddenly lose a lot of detail on your uh, displaced objects. And they kind of shift in and out and ripple and, and, pop and, and, and bubble. If this is happening to you, you may need to fade out the displacement height along with the tessellation amount based on the distance to the camera. If that is the case for you, stick around and we'll work on alleviating that. What we need to do is, based on the distance to the camera, fade out the displacement height along with the tessellation amount. Unfortunately, I haven't really found a way to access the data about the adaptive tessellation which means that we have to, to, to fix this issue, we have to turn off adaptive tessellation and create our own camera fade, uh, sort of what adaptive tessellation is doing in the background anyway. So I'm going to turn that off now and instead create a parameter here called tessellation amount, amount, not s amount. and pop that just for demonstration into tessellation multiplier. As we increase our tessellation amount parameter, uh, let's turn on Bush wireframe. Uh, we'll see the same thing that was happening with the adaptive tessellation, but this time we have manual control over it and it will apply to the entire landscape. Obviously we don't want to apply our tessellation to the entire landscape. So we're going to create a gradient that um, moves from one close to the camera to zero far away from the camera, and then apply this tessellation amount based on that gradient. So high tessellation close to the camera, low tessellation away from the camera. In other videos, I have done this type of thing with a camera depth fade node. And if we try to add things to the camera depth fade node and then multiply this tessellation amount by the camera depth fade, we will immediately get an error which says invalid node used in the shader input. Uh, even if I change this to a vertex based camera depth fade, I'll still have this error. I don't actually know why this is going on but we can't use the camera depth fade in tandem with the tessellation multiplier. So instead we're going to create our own system for doing that. The process is relatively straightforward, but just to save some time, here's one I created earlier. Let's move that over there. Move the tessellation amount, pop this in, and I will just talk about what this is doing um, rather than struggling through building it out in real time. 
what this section is doing is taking a vector from the world position of the pixel to the camera. Uh, uh, it could be the other way around, doesn't matter, because then we take the length of that, and using that length, we now know the distance from the camera to the, to the pixel. After that, I offset that length by some amount. Uh, so just as in the camera depth fade, there's a way that we can start the gradient further away from the camera if we want to, and then divide that by the fade length. So if we have a length of 500, uh, 500 units in Unreal would be 5 meters, the gradient would fade from 0 close to the camera to 1 far away from the camera um, over 5 meters. Because that gradient is switched from what we need it, we actually need 1 close to the camera and 0 far away. Then we use a 1 minus node to flip that around, and then we saturate to make sure that it's clamped between 0 and 1. And lastly, we can take the output of that and pop it into our multiply, and then our tessellation will be high, close to the camera, and low, far away from the camera. Let's apply that and just make sure that works. Okay, great. So I think I have my units correct in that our fade length is currently at 5 meters, and our fade offset is also at 5 meters. So 5 meters away from the camera uh, will begin the fade out, and then that fade out will transition over 5 meters. If we wanted to increase the length of that transition, we could increase the fade length to, say, 1500. And then we've now got a 15 meter fade out length. Up close to the camera for 5 meters, there is a uh, the, the highest level of tessellation, controlled by our tessellation amount. So we could put that all the way up to 10. I think 10 is not the max. OK. 20, maybe. Okay, so that's a ton of tessellation really close up, fading out over a certain distance. Great. At the moment, though, we have not fixed our displacement issue. So if we have a very obvious high displacement, we still have these weird rippling effects as the displacement fades out. So to get to the point of what we're, we're doing here, we are also going to take the the output of this custom depth fade, which is at the saturation node here, and not only multiply it by the tessellation multiplier, but also by the displacement itself. So we'll take the displacement, multiply it by this depth fade, meaning that we'll have the most displacement close to the camera, and then as we fade out, that displacement will fade out as well. And now, hopefully, unless you have a really egregious I guess it's still happening in this case, but with a lower displacement of 10 or so, it's beginning to alleviate that bubbliness. Not completely getting rid of it, uh, but beginning to get rid of it. We might also want to increase the distance at which the fade offset begins and then decrease the fade length. And I might even give myself a power curve before multiplying by the displacement. So if we add a power node here, we can, using the exponent, um, increase the value, increase the rate at which the fall off occurs. So I, just to demonstrate, I will create a parameter call this fade out power, pop that into the exponent, default value of one, hit apply. Oh, my bad, um, m my mistake, I, I need to power the, I need to add the curve on the um, fade out curve, not on the um, displacement itself. So adding the power to the the fade out gradient and then put that into the multiplier. Lovely, with that error corrected, we should now be able to adjust the power curve and watch how the, the fade out shifts with a higher power um, versus a lower power. So by increasing the power, we will 
increase the rate at which the fade out occurs and hopefully at least at reasonable displacement values alleviate some of that bubbling issue and for the most part that has done the trick at this point there's no one size fits all solution depending on your camera angles the textures you're using the size of your map and the amount of displacement you may need to adjust these values a little bit more or even use the default uh, adaptive tessellation if that works for you that's all from me for now i hope that this has helped you good luck in your own landscape projects and take care